last time we talked, um, you've you've talked about this intuition that we humans might be quite unique in our galactic neighborhood, perhaps our galaxy, perhaps the entirety of the observable universe. We might be the only intelligent civilization here, which is, um, and you argue pretty well for that thought. Um, so I have a, a few little questions around this. One, a scientific question, in which way would you be, if you were wrong in that intuition, in which way do you think you would be surprised? Like, why were you wrong? You We find out that you ended up being wrong. Like, in which dimension? So like, is it because we can't see them? Is it because the nature of their intelligence or the nature of their life is totally different than we can possibly imagine? Is it uh, because the, I mean, something about the great filters and surviving them, uh, or maybe uh, because we're being protected from signals? So all those explanations for, um, for why we haven't heard a big, loud, like red light that says yeah. we're here. Yeah. So there are actually two separate things there that I could be wrong about, two separate claims that I made, right? Uh, the, one, one of them is, I made the claim, I think most civilizations, when you're going from simple bacteria-like things to space, space colonizing civilizations, they spend only a very, very tiny fraction of their of their, of their life being where we are. Uh, that I could be wrong about. The other one I could be wrong about is a, a quite different statement that I think that actually, I'm guessing that we are the only civilization in our observable universe from which light has reached us so far that, that's actually gotten far enough to invent telescopes. So let's talk about maybe uh, both of them in turn because yes. they really are different. The first one, if, if, if you look at the n equals one, the data point we have on this planet, yeah. right? So we spent um, four and a half billion years futzing around on this planet with life, right? We got, and most of it was pretty lame stuff from an intelligence perspective, you know, it's bacteria and then the dinosaurs spent, then, but things gradually accelerated, right? Then the dinosaurs spent over a hundred million years stomping around here without even inventing smartphones. And, um, and then very recently, you know, it's only we've only spent 400 years going from Newton to us, right? Yeah. In terms of technology, and we've if look at what we've done. Even, you know, when I was a little kid, there was no internet even. So, it's <clears throat> I think it's pretty likely for in this case of this planet, right, that we're either gonna really get our act together and start spreading life into space, the century, and doing all sorts of great things, or where you're gonna, gonna wipe out. Um, it, it's a little hard. If I, if, I could be wrong in the sense that maybe what happened on this Earth is very atypical. And for some reason, what's more common on other planets is that they spend an enormously long time futzing around with the ham radio and things, but they just never really take it to the next level for reasons I don't have, haven't understood. And I'm humble and open to that. But I would bet, at least 10 to 1, that our situation is more typical because the whole thing with Moore's Law and accelerating technology, it's pretty obvious why it's happening. Mm -hmm. it, everything that grows exponentially, we call it an explosion, whether it's a population explosion or a nuclear explosion, it's always caused by the same thing. It's that the next step triggers a step after that. Mm -hmm. So I, we tomorrow's techno to today's technology enables tomorrow's technology and that enables the next level. And... <clears throat> As it, because the technology is always better, of course, the steps can come faster and faster. Uh, on, on the other question that I might be wrong about, that's the much more controversial one, I think. Um, but, but before we close out on this thing about, if, if the first one, if it's true that most civilizations spend only a very short amount of their total time in the stage, say, between um, inventing um, telescopes or sure. elect mastering electricity, and leaving there and doing space travel. Yeah. Uh, if that's actually generally true, but then that should apply also elsewhere 
out there. So we, we, we should be very, very, we should be very, very surprised if we find some random civilization and we happen to catch them exactly in that very, very short stage. Mm -hmm. It's much more likely that we find a planet full of bacteria. Yes. Or that we find some civilization that's already post-biological and has done some really cool galactic construction projects in, in their in their galaxy. Would we be able to recognize them, do you think? Is, is it possible that we just can't? I mean, this post-biological world, I, could it be just existing in some other dimension? It could, it could be just all a virtual reality game for them or something, I don't know, that, that it changes completely where we won't be able to detect. We have to be honestly very humble about this. Yeah. I, I think that I said. I think I said earlier the number one principle of being a scientist is you have to be humble <laughs> and willing to acknowledge that everything we think guess might be totally wrong. Uh, of course, you can imagine some civilization where they all decide to become Buddhists and very inward looking and just move into their little virtual reality and not disturb the the flora and fauna around them, and we might not notice them. Uh, but this is a numbers game, right? If you have millions of civilizations out there or billions of them, all it takes is one with a more ambitious mentality right. that decides, hey, we are going to go out and settle a bunch of other solar systems and maybe galaxies. And then it doesn't matter if they're a bunch of quiet Buddhists, we're still going to notice yeah. that expansionist one, right? Yeah. And it, it seems like a, quite the stretch to, to assume that, you know, we know even in our own galaxy that there are probably a billion or more planets that are pretty Earth-like. And many of them were formed over a billion years before ours, so had a big head start. So if you actually assume also that life happens kind of automatically on an Earth-like planet, I think it's it's pretty t quite the stretch to then go and say, okay, so we are there billions of another billion civilizations out there that also have our level of tech, and they all decided to become Buddhists. And not yeah. a single one decided to go like go Hitler on the galaxy and say we need yeah. to go out and colonize, or and or not, and not a single one decided for more benevolent reasons to go out and get more resources. That that seems seems like a bit of a stretch, frankly. And this leads into the the second thing you challenged me to be that I might be wrong about how rare or common is life, you know. So Francis Drake, when he wrote down the Drake equation, multiplied together a huge number of factors and mm -hmm. said we don't know any of them. <laughs> so we know even less about what you get when you multiply together the whole product. Yeah. Uh, since then, a lot of those factors have become much better known. Mm -hmm. One of his big uncertainties was how common is it that a solar system even has a planet? Right. Well, now we know it very common. Earth-like planets, we know we have better. There are a dime a dozen. There are yeah. many, many of them, even in our galaxy. At the same time, you know, we have, thanks to, I, I'm a big supporter of the SETI project and its cousins. Uh, and I think we should keep doing this. And we've learned a lot. We've, we've we've learned that so far, all we have is still unconvincing hints, nothing more, right? And and there are certainly many scenarios where it would be dead obvious. I, if there were a hundred million other human-like civilizations in our galaxy, it would not be that hard to notice some of them with today's mm -hmm. technology, and we haven't, right? So, so what we can what we can say is, well, okay. Uh, we can rule out that there is a human level civilization on the moon and in fact in many nearby solar systems where we <clears throat> we cannot rule out of course that there is something like earth sitting in a galaxy 5 billion light years away mm -hmm. um, but we've ruled out a lot and that's already kind of shocking given that there are all these planets there you know so yeah. like where are they where are they all that's the that's the classic fermi paradox yeah and and um so, so my argument, which might be very really wrong, is very simple, really. It just goes like this. Okay, we have no clue about this. It could be the, the, the probability of getting life on a random planet. It could be 10 to the minus 1 a priori, or 10 to the minus five, 10, or 10 to the minus 20, 10 to the minus 30, 10 to the minus 40. Basically, every order of magnitude is about equally likely. When you then do the math and ask how close is our nearest neighbor, it's again equally likely that it's ten to the ten meters away, ten to twenty meters away, ten to the thirty meters away. We can we have some nerdy ways of talking about this with Bayesian statistics and a uniform yeah. log prior, but that's irrelevant. This is the simple basic argument, and and now comes the data. So we can say, okay, 
how many or there are all these orders of magnitude 10 to the 26 meters away there's the edge of our observable universe if it's farther than that light hasn't even reached us yet if it's uh less than 10 to the 16 meters away well it's <laughs> within earth's rate it's no farther away than the sun we can definitely rule that out you know um so i think about it like this a priori before we looked with telescopes you know it could be 10 to 10 meters, 10 to 20, 10 to 30, 10 to 40, 10 to 50, 10 to blah, blah, blah. Equally likely anywhere here. Yeah. Uh, and now we've ruled out like this chunk. Yeah. And, and, so and most of and, it is outside. And, and here is the edge of our observable universe already. Yes. Yep. So I, I'm certainly not saying I don't think there's any life elsewhere in space. If space is infinite, then you're basically 100% <laughs> guaranteed that there is. But the probability that there is life, the that the nearest neighbor it happens to be in this little region between where we would have seen it already yeah. and where we will never see it is actually significantly less than one, I think. Mm. And and I think there's a moral lesson from this, which is really important, which is to be good stewards of this planet and this shot we've had. You know, it can be very dangerous to say, oh, you know, it's fine if we nuke our planet or ruin the climate or mess it up with un unaligned AI because... I know there is this nice Star Trek fleet out there. They're going to swoop in and yeah. take over where yeah. we failed. Just like it wasn't the big deal that the Easter Island losers wiped themselves out. That's a dangerous way of lulling yourself into false sense of security. If it's actually the case that it might be up to us and only us, the whole future of intelligent life in our observable universe, then I think... Um, it's both, it, it really puts a lot of responsibility on our shoulders. It's inspiring. It's a little bit terrifying, but it's also inspiring. But also, it's empowering, I think, most of all, because sure. because the biggest problem today is, I, I see this even when I teach, right? So many people feel that it doesn't matter what they do or we do. We feel disempowered. Oh, it makes no difference. This is about as far from that as you can come. I mean, we realize that what we do on our little spinning ball here in our lifetime, you know, could make the difference for the entire future of life in our universe. You know, how empowering is that? 